So I've talked about this before in this meeting, and hopefully this is close to being published. The terms have changed a little bit. Um, this is the group that has been primarily involved in creating these terms. Um, Mahmoud, uh, myself, Dave Bruning is a gastroenterologist at Mayo Clinic, Jeff Fiddler and J.G. Fletcher. So the main objective today is to talk about the impressions that we think you should be using with CT and MR enterography. Um, and it's based on a, uh, a morphologic phenotype that we see with these cross-sectional imaging studies. Uh, imaging is increasingly used to stage the degree of inflammation and intestinal damage. Um, outcomes measures are only going to be uh, able to be processed and done if we use common terms. If we don't use common terms, then we don't know what we're measuring. So this is the phenotype classification that gastroenterologists use based on Vienna Montreal, non-stricturing, non-penetrating, stricturing, penetrating, and then perianal disease. The problem is, is that there's compelling evidence that active inflammation and fibrocytosis commonly coexist, and Crohn's disease is a dynamic, often progressive process which waxes and wanes. So images, imaging identifies this dynamic process, and it isn't just one category or another category. The other is, is that there is a very, very strong relationship between fistulae and strictures. Um, one study when um, there were fistulae, stricture was present 96% of the time and another 93% of the time. And in my book, in 90% or greater in the human system is always. Um, the other is Ian Lavery is probably the most experienced colorectal surgeon at the clinic. Penetrating disease without stricture is rare, and Reed Rice taught me a long time ago, no stricture, no fistula. So if there's a stricture, look for a fistula. If there's no stricture, it's highly likely it doesn't exist. So the Montreal Vienna, uh, Vienna phenotypes cannot be reconciled with clinical findings, pathologic findings, or imaging findings, and does not account for the dynamic process. So this is a large, busy slide. I don't want you to read it, but these are all the terms that we've come up with that will be defined in the paper. What I would really, really want to do is just go focus on the imaging-based morphologic phenotypes, which will be the impression or conclusion that you draw after you have uh, interpreted your CT or MR enterography. Here's the schemata. Let's just start with active inflammatory small bowel Crohn's disease, no luminal narrowing. So you have no luminal narrowing, no upstream dilation, asymmetric wall changes, and that's important because if it isn't asymmetric, it might be nonspecific. T2 bright restricted diffusion on MR, and it is active. It's not acute or chronic. Most of what we see is chronic. You shouldn't use the word uh, acute. You should use the word active. So here is an example asymmetric change. We can see it along the mesenteric border, not along the anti-mesenteric border. A little bit of wall thickening, a little bit of hyperenhancement. Here we are in MR, T2 bright. There's actually an ulcer. Notice the asymmetry here, more ulceration on one side than the other. And here it is again. We have a little ulcer there and actually a little ulcer there. So what happens when things progress? They can go back and forth. What happens to progress? Well, the lumen narrows, but there's no upstream dilation. So again, luminal narrowing, no upstream dilation, hyperenhancement, T2 bright, restricted diffusion, wall thickening, mesenteric changes. Here's an example of stratified hyperenhancement pattern. I don't use the word mucosal because most of the time mucosa is gone. So it's just stratified. We really don't know what this is other than a lot of active inflammation. Um, wall thickening, we can see basa recta, which are distended. Here's the MR, T2 bright, wall thickening, no luminal uh, dilation upstream, but there's luminal narrowing at the site of active disease. And then here's an example where we've got a uh, fat-saturated uh, T2 increased signal. Um, there's the hyperenhancement, and there's the restricted diffusion. Okay, Crohn's without active inflammation. That means that the patient has known Crohn's, so there's evidence of prior disease, but what has happened is, is because of uh, therapy, the disease is no longer active. So it requires prior findings of active disease, no or minimal wall enhancement, and sometimes I'm kind of hedging. I don't really know if it's active or not, so I may give two. No T2 bright or restricted diffusion. Wall thickening is variably present. Most of the time it is, but it's not significant. 
the lumen is normal and no mesenteric changes. And here's an example in February of 2012. Here we have, uh, we have active disease with luminal narrowing but without upstream dilation right here in the terminal ilium. And after three months of, uh, of uh, medical therapy, 6MP, we can see just very, very, very minimal hyperenhancement, some wall thickening, and so this is inactive Crohn's disease. Okay, what happens when things progress as we go down uh, and we start developing a stricture? Well, you've got luminal narrowing, but then you have upstream dilation. So this is stricture formation. And in fact, if you look at the pathology reports, their definition of a stricture is that the stricture is there when the lumen is gone. So, you know, it is a stricture, but we have defined it as you see upstream dilation, wall thickening, wall hyperenhancement, T2 bright restricted diffusion. Everything that's there on active disease is going to be there with uh, stricture development and active Crohn's disease. Now, I used to call this mixed fiber stenotic, but we just changed it to stenotic. There's some gastroenterologists that don't like the F word. Um, truth be known, there is fibrosis in there. The real question is, is it reversible or not? It can be reversible, but they don't want to imply that it's non-reversible. So we've had to do this kind of back and forth, okay, what do you want to call it? And they don't like the word fibrostenosis. So here's probably the most egregious example that I have. I've shown this before. We have multiple sites of luminal narrowing. We have stratified hyperenhancement pattern, but this, all these dilated loops are not colon, but small bowel. And here we are uh, in the coronal, a lot of active disease. Notice the asymmetry here. We've got some pills or enteroliths that are upstream to these strictures, but they're strictures that have active inflammation because you see the findings of active inflammation with a stratified hyperenhancement pattern. And looks very much the same on MR. Again, notice the asymmetry, the pseudosacculations here, because along the mesenteric border, there's total effacement of the wall. Um, there is no other disease in the world that looks like this. I mean, it is, this is Crohn's disease. It's easy to see. Here we are on the fat-saturated images where we have T2 bright. Um, there's the hyperenhancement. Um, and here's the ADC map and the diffusion. Uh, and there is restricted diffusion. Uh, let me just go back on that one. Um, there's more and more evidence that if we do our delayed post-contrast imaging, that post-contrast enhancement on delayed imaging is very indicative of fibrosis. So we're getting better and better and better at being able to quantify whether or not fibrosis is there and how much is there. Okay, penetrating disease. Now, I've got two arrows here, one going from stricture and one going from here. I have seen one or two cases, and I've seen thousands of MRs and CTs with Crohn's disease over the last seven or eight years. I would say that it's almost always you've got a stricture when you've got penetrating disease. It is uncommon to rare that you have just luminal narrowing without upstream dilation that goes down here. But we put it here because it can happen, and we just want to make sure that everybody's looking for a fistula. Now, I've got a little arrow that's going back here. Frankly, I've never seen a complex fistula get better with medical therapy. Okay, penetrating disease can be added to active or mixed, um, or the stenosis or, or stricture with active inflammation. Um, it's a question whether the penetrating disease exists um, with fibrosynodic disease when there's no active inflammation. I have never seen it. Most of the people that I know who read a lot of these have never seen it. You're looking for sinus tracts or fistulae and inflammatory mass and abscess or free perforation, which fortunately we don't actually see very often, doesn't happen very often. They go straight to the OR. We don't, we don't really image these people. So here's an example. We've got uh, an area of small bowel disease right here, active inflammation with stricture formation. There is a fistula here to the sigmoid colon, seen a little bit better there. And here we have, in the coronal view, the same loop of bowel, but notice that there is a fistula going down to the dome of the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is tented, it's tethered, there's thickening of the wall, notice there's no gas. It is uncommon that you see gas in the bladder when there is a fistula from the small bowel and Crohn's disease, just the way it is. Um, but this is still a fistula, and when they go and resect this, they'll do an in-block resection, including a portion of the, of the uh, dome of the urinary bladder. 
These look the same on uh, MR. I mean, it's, it, MR and CT are, are basically the same morphologically. Here we've got a complex fistula between a loop of small bowel, a loop of small bowel, and cecum. Notice the tethering. Notice the angulation. Notice the fixation here that we can take barium terms and apply them to cross-sectional imaging. Here's the fistula to the urinary bladder, and here's the fistula down to the sigmoid colon. Now, one comment about why do I call this a stricture with active inflammation when there's no upstream dilation? And the reason is, is because the fistula is there and pops off the pressure. So I still call this stricture with active inflammation with penetrating disease because that's in fact what's happening. All right, what about stricture without active inflammation? These are patients uh, that have burned out Crohn's disease. Most of these people have some degree of upstream dilation. Uh, these are folks that have accommodated to their disease um, and uh, regulate their diet, and they walk around with these dilated loops and strictures, so there's no or minimal wall thickening, luminal narrowing, may or may not have upstream dilation. Most of what I've seen is upstream dilation. No hyperenhancement, not T2 bright or restricted diffusion. And again, we're not calling these uh, fibrostenotic, we're just calling them strictures without active inflammation. Here are two uh, examples. The first example, the uh, gastroenterologist didn't read um, prior reports, gave a capsule. Um, there's the stricture right there. Here's the capsule. There's no uh, hyperenhancement right there. And here's the barium study, which was done several months before the CT enterography was performed. And here's an example uh, where we had, again, good barium uh, correlation. There's the stricture without active inflammation. There's no hyperenhancement. And there's the stricture on the, plain f on the, uh, on the barium study. Okay, what about nonspecific and no active inflammatory small bowel uh, Crohn's disease? No active inflammatory small bowel Crohn's disease is what I use when we're doing just a survey. They think the patient might have a Crohn's, to have Crohn's disease, or they've got a colitis and they want to make sure there is no small bowel disease. So there's no mural findings of active inflammation. It's a normal study and often, again, often used for patients with a colitis. And then nonspecific should be used if you're really not sure what the cause is. All right, if it doesn't have all the typical findings of Crohn's disease, you should use the word nonspecific. I don't use this very often because most of the patients that I do, I already know they have Crohn's disease. So here's a couple of examples of, of uh, nonspecific inflammatory change. This is a radiation stricture here, right here. And notice that it's pretty symmetric. It's not asymmetric. Here's a patient with backwash ileitis after a proctocolectomy for UC, and I put this in quotes because you should know that about 15% of patients that have an indeterminate colitis and have a colectomy will develop Crohn's disease in the future. All right, so what you'll see most of the time is you'll see um, active inflammatory or nonspecific without luminal narrowing. It'll go back and forth to luminal narrowing, uh, go down into stricture development. Most of the time, at least in my experience, this does not go back here. You may see some of this, but really penetrating disease is stricture developed with active inflammation. You won't see a lot of this because most of these people are not that sick and have accommodated to their disease. So in conclusion, the, the phenotype classification of the gastroenterologist really has no application to the disease. I never have understood it. I don't continue to understand. I mean, I don't know why they use it. It's just because I think that's the only thing they have. I really think that the morphologic phenotypes are the way to go. Uh, and will and should be used by all of you in the future. Um, it is in the process of getting ACG approval. This has just been a two and a half, three year pro process that's just been painful. So I'll leave you, get up into the mountains. The mountains are beautiful. The aspen are changing. The maples are changing. So enjoy the fall. Thank you.